Hello, and welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to people who are out there actively making and doing creative work. I want to know more about their materials, their processes, what it is that motivates or inspires them to keep creating. And along the way, I'm also learning more about the nature of creativity itself. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, and in this episode, I'll be talking with furniture maker and woodcarver Adrian McCurdy. Adrian produces absolutely beautiful work, largely from riven oak. His furniture combines a deep and intuitive understanding of wood with simple techniques and a sculptural approach to form that results in a unique and timeless style. Adrian is also beginning to explore a new format, applying his skills to carved panels, which we'll also cover in this episode. In this conversation, we'll talk about maintaining perspective when working slowly, why he doesn't get stuck, which I found really interesting, the importance of routine, making room for play, how he makes and adapts his own tools, which is not for the faint-hearted, and the practices he follows to avoid burnout. So please, enjoy this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast. I'm Adrian McCurdy. I make furniture and also carved panels, and I work in wood. And when you say carved panels, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, they're really wall hangings. Um, it's a bit like the front of a chest, perhaps that's not a piece of furniture anymore. It's just a carved wooden board, a plank perhaps, hanging up from the wall to be to be viewed there, a bit like a painting. And why wood? Well, uh, that goes back to my father being a furniture maker. Some people say that means you've got sawdust in the brain. You know, it's, a, it's a, just a gene thing, um, uh, a familiarity to a material from a very young age and I didn't sort of question it really other than the fact that I didn't want to be a furniture maker when I went to art college I mean I, I just didn't want to follow the kind of intense path that my father had done you know with various characters in the arts and craft movement that he was emulating and you know it was very refined and quite perfectionistic so I went to art college, you know, and so you could do anything there. And um, my brother Peter did architecture uh, and my younger brother Martin, they both did architecture and they both worked in wood. I'm not sure how much of a talent is in the genes or how much is just in your expectation of yourself to be able to master a material, you know, and do something individual with it. One of the things that really attracted me to your work was the uneven quality, if that doesn't sound uh, insulting to you, the roughness of it. And I understand that a lot of that comes down to the fact that you're working both with traditional tools informed by your studies of medieval furniture making and techniques, but also the working with riven wood. So could you explain what riven wood is and why you've chosen to work in that way? Um, riven wood is wood that's been split rather than being sawn. So rather than going to a sawmill to buy your material, you really take control from the outset by splitting up a big log. It's not used very much at all other than for perhaps legs of stools and chairs. And it was once upon a time known as a bodger's craft. Somebody in the wood would be splitting up billets of wood that would eventually be turned on a lathe um, for furniture. But I wanted to take it to another level, really, and just really experiment with the potential that a larger log might provide. And it's quite an ambitious project to split a big log up, but it's not physically, you know, too exhausting if you just follow a, a technique. Um, So I experimented, and the results mean that um, you're not starting with anything that's been squared off. It's not been flattened or squared in the way that most planks have been processed. It hasn't been through that stage. It's purely really a result of releasing the internal grain of the tree by splitting. So each piece is different, and each piece will have undulations or twists to it, and that's what you have to deal with. And that sounds more difficult in that there are no true square edges, there's no straight lines. So what's the benefit of of working that way? Well, the benefit is a sculptural benefit and also 
the quality of the material is just unsurpassed, really, in terms of strength, stability, because although it might look as though it has a twist to it, actually a piece of riven oak is more stable than the flattest plank you could buy in a sawmill. All the tension has been removed, and that's it, really. You know, it's, it's, it's the most wonderful thing to start with. Are you saying it's less likely to warp once you've split it? Yeah, it's done it. I mean, all the, re- the tension has been released through splitting, and consequently it's got nowhere to go. Even as it dries, it's still going to stay as true as it roughly as it was when you first split it. Yeah, absolutely. It's got no tension within it. It'll shrink, obviously, you know, in the two directions that wood shrinks, but it, it won't have any tendency to change with the internal grain of the tree because the shape itself has followed the grain. Mm. So what, what does that give you? Uh, obviously, there's, there's a structural strength that comes from that. What, what does it give you creatively as opposed to something that's already flat and perfectly square? Right. Well, I probably ought to start off by saying, first of all, it gives you a problem in terms of construction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it's not been flattened, it's not very suitable for machining. So the convention these days of flattening and cutting joints by a machine, it just goes out the window. You can't apply that. So you've got to think back. You've got to think back to how people might have done this at a time before everybody had machines, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, you might well ask the purpose why I've chosen to do it. And it's purely because I find it a more expressive form of, of wood and what it might make and you know there's every there's an abundance of comfort and abundance of strength in wood that's been split so if you were just going to make a simple chair for instance or a, a seat a stool then the way i see it you've a superior material to begin with so it's worth the effort it's worth the time And when you say there's comfort in that, is the comfort literally physical comfort? It's a more comfortable chair, it's a more comfortable shape to sit in. I'm talking about the physical comfort of a shape that's got a natural concave surface to the top, if you choose it to be that way around. Because the wood doesn't split flat, it tends to split with a slight curve to it. So, you know, that's, that's a comfort shape, a natural comfort shape. You don't have to put it upon the wood, it's there already. You just follow it with with your hand tools. So you went to art school, so it sounds like you would have had exposure to a range of other material, and you also explored painting. What do you think you got from art school, and what do you feel you learned from working with paint and canvas, and how that's influenced the work that you're making now? Well, I went to an art school in the... um, early 1970s and I mean really it was just so such a wide option as to what you did I I did a fine art course it was painting and sculpture but very few people painted and very few people made sculpture I mean people spent three years on typewriters just composing statements about what an art piece is you know Uh, it was all happening there and there were people doing videos and people playing music um, you know, it was all happening. So really what I did was fairly conventional. I wanted to make sculpture. I wanted to make big sculpture and sort of occupy room spaces in a kind of architectural way with lines. I experimented a bit with wood, but I wasn't sort of in any way, you know, glued to kind of that as a material. I used fiberglass, made some chipboard sculptures and dyed them quite bright colours and hinged all these shapes so they kind of folded up. And I also did a bit of painting, but I I did more sculpture at college. But when I left college, I really wanted to paint. I think I was influenced by some of the lecturers I had in my foundation course. And I wanted to paint, and I wanted to use watercolours, and I wanted to work from landscape. And I moved to Scotland. I moved to Scotland to get these sort of raw elements, you know, and and let that influence my my work. But I very quickly began to fall back onto woodwork as um, a second income. I mean, it was just, it was such an easy thing for me. I didn't need any training. 
two days a week for a furniture maker for a year. And then my brothers formed a company restoring oak timber frame buildings in Berkshire. And I quickly realised, you know, there was an option for me to use that as a second income, to go down, you know, back to my sort of homeland, really, and um, just kind of pitch in on whatever jobs they were doing. And so it began a kind of routine for about 12 years, or maybe longer than that, when I would leave my little house in Scotland and, and go and help with projects and learn all about oak and structural repairs. Um, and the projects got bigger and bigger, and, and the last big project was Globe Theatre in London. I, I worked on the Globe Theatre. That was a very long stint. That was nine months. And, um, you know, I mean, that was fantastic. My brother finished up with a, a gang of about nearly 30 people working on that, and we we made use of an American air hangar on Greenham Common. Obviously, it ceased to be the American air base there. It was an industrial kind of premises and um, we took over this, this air hangar for two years and that's where the Globe Theatre was com- completed. So something that you had a, a background in growing up, you left behind, went to art school, got into painting and then it sounds like it was a practical choice to come back to the woodworking. At what point did the woodworking start to supersede the painting? It it did but not in the way that I've described, I mean, I had this routine that went on while I was painting here in the Scottish borders that I would go away and come back. The painting ceased very abruptly during one big project I helped with my brother in York. And it was a sort of late 15th century townhouse right in the middle of York, which is there now open to the public. And the project was to restore this building and erect it, re-erect it in York. And while we were doing that, um, I met the historian whose job was to furnish the building to make it open to the public. And he didn't know who to turn to to ask to make the furniture. Um, And he wanted sort of fresh-looking medieval furniture. He didn't want old blackened Tudor stuff, the types that you see on the telly. You know, this this was to look real to the period. and. i have been kind of thinking, I don't want to go on doing this heavy building joinery for the rest of my life because I'm going to wear myself out, you know. I also had made a kind of decision that I didn't think I was going to make it as a painter. And I wanted my own profession and independence. So I saw furniture, you know, particularly this medieval furniture, as a sort of way to get into a different craft. I thought I had all the background necessary. I was very happy to make medieval furniture looking freshly made with no darkening, no distressing or aging. That was very natural to me because that was actually my father's kind of influence there, you know, from the arts and craft Cotswold background. So that wasn't a problem. And then, um, so I, I got some commissions to York, quite a lot of work, actually, you know, about a year's work. And I just stopped painting immediately and I decided I was going to learn everything I needed to about this ancient oak furniture. And I went round all the museums and into the storage facilities that they have. You know, if you have a research project, you're allowed to go into the V&A storage buildings with a member of staff and you can you can get as close as you want. You can open doors, you can photograph things. It's completely different from the actual museum. So I got really close up to things and I I was able to kind of analyse the tools that were used. This is There's actually a way of doing that that my brother had been studying for his historical building projects. You can study the, the tools that were used on the wood by shining a torch very low to the surface. The you, you can pick up the rhythm of the tools that were used on the surface 500 years before. They're still there. The pattern of the tools shows the width of the blade that was used. You could then say, well, this was definitely finished with such and such a tool. Yes, that makes sense to me. That's what I would want to use myself, you know. So, um, well, I had a period, actually, when I was 
couldn't start anything. I had a period of about nine months before I was allowed to begin these commissions to this museum in York. And I decided this was going to be a period of experimentation and making some of the pieces which I admired most from that early period, some replications. And, and that's what I did. So you were researching these, I'm not sure if I can use the word ancient, you're researching these older, very traditional techniques and discovering specific tools and manners of working. How has that influenced the work that you do now? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I've remained very faithful to a lot of the tools. You know, I like them because they're very direct. You don't need to sand after using an ants or a spoke shave or a wooden plane. That's it. That's the finish. And that's something, it's a quality I really, really like. You know, it's a tactile quality. And other people, not everybody, but a lot of people do see this and they appreciate it. And to me, it's part of the craft. You know, it's the craft of making something by hand is being able to finish it by hand and not have to kind of eradicate some machine tool with sanding. So I, I'd like to go back to the, to the wall panels briefly. Uh, I, I'm wondering what parallels or influences you think you might have from your experience of painting, taking them into the, the design or the, the conceptualization of the, the wall panel. My paintings were predominantly about details of landscape and in particular water. No surprise, perhaps. Um, but I wasn't dealing with moving water and the complications. I was just dealing with it as a flat surface that you could see through and take reflections from. My wooden panels are about a shallow depth of shape that is very responsive to light in a physical way, um, rather than being illusionistic. They need illumination, they need to be modelled somehow because they have a three-dimensional surface to them. But having said that, uh, one of my main fascinations at the moment is the grain of the wood that is not illusionistic. It's there and it changes with the undulations that I'm putting upon the wood. So, you know, it, it, there are different sort of kind of readings that you can make of them. Yeah, and I think there's something fascinating about the fact that you are intentionally creating a surface that, that responds to the light, that, that the light is required in order to highlight the movement that you've created in the wood, which is an exact parallel of the technique you learned from your brother of shining a light in order to see the rhythms and patterns of the tools that were used to make the original medieval furniture. Yeah. And that there, there's a, a very clear, in my mind, a very clear connection between those two ways of looking at the marks on wood or, or creating marks on wood. Is that something that you were conscious of or is that something that those two ways of working have uh, sort of evolved in parallel? Well, I think they've evolved in parallel, but I think you're right that um, I have had a very sort of, uh, you know, quite a deep interest in subtle changes to a surface from using tools like ANSYS on stool seats. And I'm often lifting these up when I'm in an exhibition and people are looking at something together with me. I will often lift it up and turn it so there's a light beyond. So to get this reflection, to show the subtle effects, I mean, generally speaking, they're more hidden in a gallery than they are in a house for unfortunate reasons, but it's to do with windows and you know, natural light coming in. So I feel I have to demonstrate with the furniture the subtleties. But, you know, that's about the surface of the wood and how it's affected by light in a very similar way. Yeah. Could, could you just give us a quick run through of the tools that you do use? Well, if we're specifically talking about splitting, then it's wedges and mallets and... I also use electrical tools just to speed up the process a bit, the initial process. But the hand tools really, adzes, spoke shaves, wooden planes, and quite an assortment of hand electric tools, 
I mean, I'm not using hand drills. I use electric drills, you know. Um, and I doctor things. I doctor electric planes so they can move over a contoured surface. <laughs> How does that work? Well, what it is, is when you buy an electric hat, when you buy an electric hand plane, like all machinery, it's absolutely flat underneath. So it only works when it moves over flat wood. So if you have a piece of undulating wood, you need something that has a more flexible shape, or at least a shape that will move over these undulations. So I take the bottoms off the plane and remake them with wood. And, <laughs> and um, I'm not sure about health and safety, but um, I wouldn't recommend this to other people. <laughs> I have to say, you have to be very choosy about the wood you use. You really have to be very instinctively knowledgeable that you're not endangering yourself when you when you do this. But, um, you know, I've made electric planes shapely underneath, and I've curved the blades in the other direction. Wow. So, I mean, it is like, it's like a hand wooden planer, but it's it's electric. Fantastic. Are, are there any other adaptations that you've made to existing tools? Oh, uh, well, there's lots, actually. I mean, I, um, I began, before I had a lathe, I made a whole set of pencil sharpeners for chair legs and table legs, the tops, the round tops of these legs. And I followed some illustrations of early coppice tools. And I made pencil sharpeners that can, you know, turn a two-inch top to a leg. It's a bit difficult to describe, but it's basically a block of wood that has a four-inch blade in a tapered hole, and then you have two handles that, that you turn, and um, out from the top pops this uh, nice round two-inch leg top. Oh, so the the leg is held rigid, and you're turning That's right. the sharpener around it, and it's built like a standard pencil sharpener, the little plastic or metal yeah. block that you stick a pencil in, and you yeah. turn the pencil. You just scale that up. Yeah, the difference is that the leg comes through the top, of my little machine. Okay. Whereas with a pencil sharpener, obviously it just goes to a point. But it's such simple technology, and I, and I really love these these sort of simple solutions. You know, I mean, I, I do have a Chinese lathe now, which is very adequate to, for um, much of what I do. But interestingly, I've had to make adaptions to this because because I use a lot of cleft shapes for legs. They're not straight, so they've got quite eccentric curves and sometimes a double curve like a swan neck and um, when you put these on a lathe you have to choose the alignment of the leg top it's not necessarily following the line of the undulating wood so I mean you know I have to uh, add weights and all sorts of things in order <laughs> to be able to complete this this sort of thing Wow. That's a bit difficult to describe. I could, um, if I showed you a, a short video of what was happening, you'd, <laughs> you'd be quite surprised. But it was interesting that you mentioned the care and the time it takes to work with this wood being as uneven as it is, is something you can't do when you're under the pressure of money. And I'm wondering how you balance that financial imperative of working slowly uh, and carefully as you do and responding to the wood as it comes uh, as opposed to being able to cut, say, 20 chair seats in one go. How do you balance that creativity versus the financial aspects of making a living as a craftsperson? Well, we're great difficulty. There's no simple solution to it at all. And I think at periods of my life, I've put myself under too much pressure. You know, I think I've suffered. I've suffered a bit of stress connected to this, actually. And it's taken much of my working life to realise that I can't keep up with the production that other people do. It's always going to be special one-off pieces, or perhaps two at a time. Two seems efficient. One's one making one thing at a time always feels very, very inefficient. But I've just grown to accept it over the time. But, I mean, it has caused quite a bit of stress, actually. You know, in terms of your aspiration for the day, I mean, doing things on a day-by-day -day basis. Okay, so what am I going to achieve today? I'm going to achieve so much. And then you go out and um, you don't get there 
yeah, and you don't get there the next day as well, or the next day, and you and and so the tension can build up, you know, and you start to feel that you're really never going to be compensated for your time. But um, then you remind yourself that in fact it's not just a job; it's an art, you know, and you should be taking care and doing it to the best that you can, and exploring, you know, the um, the possibilities. That's what gives me satisfaction. It's not doing a stall in half the time, you know. It's doing something completely different and really surprising the self as well. And that generally is what is appreciated by other people. I step out of my comfort zone and do something different. That seems to be something read by other people, you know, as being worthwhile. And how often does that happen, that you surprise yourself or that you feel like you're pushing the limits of your ability or, or aesthetic? Well, not often enough would be the answer, truthfully. You know, if I was perhaps more collectible, then I would be experimenting more. You know, I wouldn't be trying to kind of find a bread and butter line, you know. I think at this stage in my life, I think I should be involved in pieces that are meaningful to me, you know, um, with the time I've got left to experiment, really. I'm glad you mentioned that, because I wonder if you were to look back on your your life and your career and the, the the route that you've taken to where you are, what do you know now that you wish you had known earlier? Or you did, words of wisdom that you could <laughs> give to yourself, to your younger self? Um, and you may not have any. <laughs> well, I think I think probably you know just make sure that there's time for play. I think that would be a very important aspect. Remember, Adrian, that, you know, you've come to furniture through a creative background and you're not going to compete with other people. It's very important that I explore that creativity um, on a regular basis. What would that, What does that look like for you? I think the most important thing is that you start and you see something through to a finish. You know, you don't make plans and start and stop and pick it up two or three months later. You just choose to make something that can be seen all the way through without technical problems, without a great amount of conscious thought necessarily, you know, just just following something through. Just the way I might teach someone. If somebody came into my workshop and they said, I'd really love to make something, I would just lay into some wood. I wouldn't be thinking twice about, was this right? And and does this have a perfectly balanced shape? And so, you know, at the end of the day, there would be a piece of, a little piece of furniture and somebody would be very happy. And... um, I learn something from that kind of immediacy, that spontaneity. Um, I think I'm, I'm finding my way to it a bit more, not with furniture, but with carved panels, because these are a bit more like an art object. They're wall hangings. They don't take up a lot of space. If they fail, well, okay, you know, I've just been through an interesting experiment, perhaps, and wasted a lot of wood. Um, I get on with another one. You know, I move on in that in that kind of way that you do when you're making artwork. You really should expect to make mistakes, to make failures. But you can't do that with furniture generally. It's a much more precious experience about the material. If you don't mind, I'd like to go back to your working process in a water context. Could you describe what your studio looks like? Because it sounds like it's not a single space. My studio is really a shed that's doubled in size um, with a covered area outside for the dirty jobs, like a tarpaulin extending out from the, um, from the shed size. Um, it's about 16 foot long. It's a very convenient size to heat. I think that's an important thing. Li- living and working frugally, you need to think about these things. And I'm, I keep reminding myself that, in fact, it's not a big space to heat. There's a little wood-burning stove in there. It does the job pretty pretty well. 
but I use other spaces around. I've got other, I've got, you know, a, a small barn which I use for photography, for instance. That's an interest of mine. I've got some large storage spaces for all this wood which I've been splitting up. That's the most space. Most space is taken out of storage of material. And the beauty of oak is that it's so durable, it's not affected by woodworm or much, much at all, actually. It just sits there and just gradually, gradually hardens and probably darkens very slightly as well. It's there forever. You can, I can go back to it forever. There's no worry about it at all. And do you have a, a typical working day? Well, I'll give you a summer working day because in the winter things change sort of radically to do with the daylight hours. So in the summer, um, if I get going at eight, that's the magic hour. If I get going at eight, the whole day is relaxed. It doesn't matter if I need to go off to the local town, which is four miles away, you know, to do a bit of shopping. I can fit that in as well. Um, I can get a day's work done. So if I start at eight through to lunchtime, coffee break in the middle of the morning I'm pretty strict about these things you know I, I, I like I like a time when I stop in the morning I like a time when I stop in the afternoon and I like to do something of physical exercise as well at the end of the day um, swimming, walking, cycling one of, one of those three usually I like to get out and have a walk so I try and I usually keep the pressure up for about five to six days and on average I would probably get about four days in the workshop if I apply myself for most of six. That's the way it is. There are so many interruptions to running your own business, doing your own publicity, taking work to exhibitions. It just it never really stops, you know, the subsidiary kind of jobs that you have to do. So that's the way I get around it. I decide if I'm not going to have a long weekend away, then I'm going to apply myself to most of six days. And hopefully I'll get four. <laughs> so do you find having a routine helps to, to structure your time and ensure that you get the work done? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it does. Because it's very time consuming. I can't go out, you know, and be very quick and efficient about very much at all. You know, everything is spread over a, a period of days or weeks or even months. And I've just learned that, you know, get that early start to the day, apply yourself, don't be distracted by anything that's not absolutely vital. And um, that's how I get satisfaction, really. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing the finished piece of work. You know, I, I'm not wanting to labour unnecessarily on anything, but I do enjoy doing things in a certain way, you know. <laughs> and is there anything that you do before you get into the studio to sort of uh, prepare you for the day that gets you ready to work? Well, interestingly, you should ask that right now, but I have been following a meditation website recently. Mm. And I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's an American website, and um, it's been really helpful to my concentration and those swirling thoughts that can go through your mind so much of the time, particularly if you work on your own. Mm. And, you know, I just think more and more of them arrive as you get older, and they can just absorb your thinking all day if you're not careful. So, I mean, I've been learning quite a bit about that. It's been really useful. So, I, I listen to a um, meditation website called Calm.com. It's a very charming woman who, who gives a daily calm, and there's every other aspect of meditation there for you as well. And the other thing I follow a lot in the evenings is, um, I think it's an American jazz radio program called um, Jazz Radio which I also subscribe to. You know, they're very healing, I find, to me, in terms of just relaxing and feeling good about what I'm doing and everything else. When you're working, do you ever get stuck? No. <laughs> and why not? Um, that sounds like a very privileged position <laughs> to be in. I don't really know what... what um, 
what kind of feeling that is. Um, no, I mean, there's so many ideas at the back of my mind. You know, I know they're there, and I only have to walk into my wood pile, and I come away with, you know, half a dozen ideas of things I once thought I'd like to make or new combinations. I can't get stuck, you know. It's all there, really. It's not far away. Do you feel that everyone has the potential to be creative or that everyone is creative? Definitely. I think everybody has got the potential and every profession and activity has the potential to have a creative expression in. I've never doubted that, you know. I mean, if I picked people that seem exemplary in terms of creativity, I probably wouldn't choose an artist or a craftsperson. I'd probably choose a cook, you know, or a gardener or someone like, like that. I think one of the things is, I thought about this and I thought, well, what about the pensioners? You know, these days people are retiring and they're taking, taking up the arts. You know, they're learning to paint or it becomes a second career. They, they've um, retired from teaching or something like that. You know, this is happening all over, certainly all over Scotland. People are sort of migrating to Scotland to become an artist as a second career. And what they do in most cases is that they, they discover a product which they're happy to make and they tend to stick with that, you know. And I don't think that's greatly creative in the kind of essence of what, what the word means. Because I think it all, I think creativity to me is keeping all the doors open, you know, reaching out that little bit further. Um, and I think it's easy to do if you've got a foundation, you know, a bit like a, a bit like the tree of life that you've got this sort of base to your exploration of creativity. And as the tree moves away from the base and branches, and you have all these options, you know, but they're all connected down to a sort of base of your knowledge and familiarity so that you can reach further, really, because, you know, you've got this experience behind you. But it's that moment of actually seeing something new and allowing it to take fruition. I mean, visually, it usually means, for the visual artist, it means making something and giving time, you know, to that little idea to see if it's worthwhile. Do you have a creative challenge for listeners? Well, I had a little think about this, and I did write something down. Would that be okay to read it? Absolutely, absolutely. This is what I've, I've suggested. Keep one picture from a walk each day of a small area of ground you pass. Take as many pictures as you want, but only keep one. Build up a folio of 20 to 30 images, representing one for each day. Look for patterns, colours, shapes, different surfaces, plants, flowers, raindrops in puddles, frosted leaves, um, or any random mix of objects. And... My idea, really, is that when small things are isolated, they can look completely different. And until you go through this process of actually making the selection, which is when you press the shutter of your camera, you haven't selected anything. You've just gazed momentarily upon something. But when you press your shutter, you've fixed that portion of nature or whatever it might be. and then you've got the option then of selecting. And I think that's the important thing, that if you choose one for each day and make the selection that that represents that day, it brings into your kind of vocabulary or it brings into your critique the selective process, which is very important to being creative. And, um, I mean, I would hope this exercise might spring a few surprises, really. And that's, that's just about it. Fantastic. That, that sounds really exciting. I was listening to someone recently talking about the generation of creative ideas. And he was talking about the merits of constraints, that the more you constrain 
your options, the more creative you become because yeah. you're not overwhelmed by too many yeah. possibilities. And, and w what you're asking people is to really focus down and narrow it down, their focus and their attention, and then choose just that one image, which is lovely. And it'll be very interesting to look back then over those that portfolio of 20 to 30 and see what comes out. What has the eye been drawn to throughout that period of time? What might have changed over time? Uh, how your own taste or focus might have changed as you start looking for opportunities after the first photo. The next photo you go, oh, maybe I'll look for something you know, bigger, smaller, more colorful. It might be interesting to see what, what evolves over time. That's very exciting. That's very well put. That's kind of quite precisely what I was rather hoping that would eventually come out of it. You know, not necessarily in a conscious one, but towards the end of looking back over this selection process, what each individual has become more interested by or concentrated upon. I do it in my own work, you know, not very regularly, but I do sometimes. I, um, when I talk about the details of landscape being important in my work, it's often looking down quite near to where I'm standing. There's lots of things happening, and um, small is always beautiful, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Yeah, and easily overlooked. To, how, how would you define creativity? And this is my last question. <laughs> well, I think it would be something different every time you ask me that. That's a perfect answer. I think that's about as succinct as I can m make it. It's a non-tangible thing that we all experience at time when something new occurs. I think when something's truly creative, that we're left speechless. And, um, you know, I think that's a kind of level of creation that is just a wonder that is always going to happen. I mean, eventually somebody will pin down some words to describe it, but I think at the moment of seeing something truly creative, then we're all left speechless. We say, wow, we say, how fantastic, you know, but these are just common kind of expletives. Because we don't have the language for it. No, I think it's something almost too 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 special, really. Um, it's just too magical, really, to have to have words. How delightful. Well, I think that's a fantastic place to finish. Because I think that's what we're all aiming for, is, is that moment of wonder either for ourselves in the process of creating or to share that with other people, to engender that feeling yeah. in our audience or whoever it is that we're, we're creating work for. And that's just really well put and very, very beautiful and very poetic. So thank you very much, Adrian. Well, thank you very much, too. This has been an absolute delight. Thank you very much. Hey there. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of The Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about Adrian and his work, you can visit the Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life, where you'll find images of his work and links to other material. And if you'd like to have a go at Adrian's Creative Challenge, you can find a written version on the Creative Challenge page. Just head on over to the website and check it out. And if you've enjoyed this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, it would be great if you would subscribe to the show, leave a review, or follow me on Instagram, at Practical Creative. Also, just really quickly, if you're interested in ceramics, or makers with an uncompromising approach to their work, then check out my Q&A with Gareth Mason. Gareth is a ceramicist working with a highly distinctive and powerful visual language that challenges the limits of both the clay and the audience in equal measure. You can find it over on the Practical Creative website. Mm -hmm.